everyone, welcome to another episode, episode three of The Corner Blue. And today is a very special one for us. We have our first guest of honor. And we are going to have a very nice and interesting talk with the one and only Pablo Puñet, all the way from Iceland. Obviously, today's been one of those days where a lot of news has been coming out um, on a selecta. Uh, fortunately, we had the issue of a player uh, testing positive uh, in the semi burbuja uh whatever that is uh and then on top of that independently there's rumors coming out uh of concacaf canceling the first fixture so uh we talk about this and a lot more with pablo and here yeah, check out the interview hola pablo que tal hola, pablo como estas que tal mucho gusto bien, bien. mucho gusto andres Andes gracias rico. por la paciencia no y gracias por atendernos hoy este, vamos a hacer el, el cambio de, de chip al inglés, va, si no, si no hay problema. No problem at all. Sounds good, <laughs> sounds good. Pablo, um, uh, uh, let me do the official introduction. I don't know if, you, if Pablo knows Andres. So Andres and I have been friends for a while. We, um, he produced a film about the U-20 going to the first World Cup. Um, uh, Un Cielo Azul is the name, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we basically, nice. we went to Turkey together and we were roommates and we traveled through Turkey following the national team. So um, that's awesome. Yeah. So we're starting this new project and, you know, we're trying to do something different for those English speaking Salvadorians yeah. or the ones who feel more comfortable in English. I mean, I was born in El Salvador, so in a way, English is my second language, but it's all right. I was born in the U.S. and English is my second language too, so don't worry about <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Born here as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we no, but it's a really cool thing. I didn't know you guys had produced that, or you, Andres, had produced that film. That's pretty cool. You gotta, yeah, you gotta no, share uh, with me that at the end. Definitely, definitely. It was like a definitely a kind of grassroots indie as f project. Uh, <laughs> but uh, basically, I had some leftover money from. Uh, a master's program that I got over and I was like, I might as well kind of throw it into something that I really like. So, um, put the money together, just flew out to Salvador like the week before the, the world cup when they were preparing, met all the players and then tried to find my way, you know, to get access. Cause since I didn't, I didn't have a press card or anything like that, but in Salvador, you can, yeah, kind of you, formal, you can get around, <laughs> you know, the right people, you know, they're friendly enough. And I even got to go on the bus with them on the way to the airport. That's amazing. And then I flew back here to to California because I'm up here um, in the Bay Area in Vallejo. It's like an hour north of San Francisco. Cool. And then uh, I flew to Turkey, met up with them. And then unfortunately, FIFA didn't give me a credential, even though I had applied and they, they had approved it and everything. But, wow. you know, I knew the coaching staff by then. So they helped me out, other members of the press. So it worked out. We got footage, footage of the, the locker room. Um, during the game against Australia. So that was pretty cool to get all that access. So, yeah, That's amazing, man. That's a cool story. Yeah, it's just the only problem is since, like, the manuals came up around that time, there was just mm. a lot of bad press, and uh, I guess interest kind of dropped in it. So it didn't really get mm. going uh, or the support in country. But I think with, mm. with the anniversaries that come up and just the importance of that, that whole event itself – I think that'll give it some weight. And so hopefully with the retrospective, maybe I can re-release it or come up with something different. So we'll see. That's cool. I mean, the idea itself is really solid, but you're right. Ex executing it is, is, is a whole other story. So definitely, definitely. But it was a ton of fun and it, it led to some other gigs. So like, I'm totally happy that I did it. And I think nice. in the future it might redeem itself, you know, just because it's something historic. And so we'll see. That's really cool, man. I applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. But um, we wanted it first. Thank you for the time. And you're our official first guest here on The Corner Blue. We're on episode three. Cool. We'll see how the the backing for this. We'll try and get our following on this. But it's been fun <laughs> uh, trying to bring different opinions and different stories to it. Because, you know, there's a lot of um, access to medium in Salvador in Spanish, but sometimes the fans abroad kind of get left behind in a sense. So we kind of wanted mm. to provide some type of platform or, or a way for fans to, 
to communicate and be on top of things and have it more accessible to them in English. So th this is this is a fruit of of that endeavor. But more than anything, I mean, ha you did you hear the news today? Have have you been reading up or catching up on the on the news coming out of it, Sarbello? Are you talking about the the COVID situation? Yeah, yeah, and then and then obviously the the rumors, I guess, because it's nothing confirmed by Concacaf on the postponement of the October fixtures as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's it's not it's no secret that El Salvador isn't over that hump yet. Uh, you know, we're we're they're not even accepting you know passengers into the country. So already, it's a difficult situation. And, uh, you know, I guess you, this is not going to be the, the first and only positive that will come up in the soccer world there. I think, obviously, health and safety first, and then you can get around to playing. But uh, I don't know how they're going to handle this kind of situation. That's, uh, all of this is unprecedented. So, Have you heard from any of the players at all? Because I, I bet they're kind of bummed out that, you know, now they're stuck for what 14 days inside the festival, <laughs> according to uh, some outlets in Yeah, I've heard, I've heard from them. We have a, a chat group with the with most of the base of the national team, and <laughs> mainly they're freaking out because like they don't know what's gonna happen, you know. And uh, and this was just a microciclo, which is not even an official gathering of the national team. It's just some practices and stuff. So again, I have no idea how they're gonna handle it. But uh, but it was an asymptomatic uh, positive apparently, and uh, which is pretty pretty key, I guess you know, in hopes yeah, that and hopes it didn't really spread. Yeah, exactly. And and the curious thing is also they've been, they've been tested every single day, and this is their third day in the concentration, and it's been negative up until now. So it could be a false positive. I'm not even sure if that's possible, but it could be a false positive. I, I think so, there is. Um... I think it's like a twenty eight percent chance of, of false positive. Yeah, so that, that that might be the case in this situation. But again, I don't know how fast food and how Concacaf is gonna handle the situation, but it's it's difficult. That's that's all I, that's as much as I can say about that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think in, in part the change to the format seems a little too precipitated. Um, and now you're seeing the consequences of that with October. I mean, it's not official yet, but yeah, that there's rumors that, that it's been canceled. Um, how did you feel about it personally when you found out about the, the change of the format when it seemed, you know, it's not that we had clinched the sixth spot per se, but mm -hmm. it seemed like it was in the bag and then, you know, having to confront the reality of the, the new, new format. Yeah, it definitely sucked for sure. And I, you know, I'm looking at these news and I'm not believing it and, and I, you know, you, you could, you can open up the can of worms and say like, you know, where's the president of CONCACAF from and stuff like that. But bottom line is it's a really odd number of five to choose into this. Um, they could have just chosen six and then created this sort of format to allow other two teams to come in, you know, uh, if they were going to expand it, they could have chosen four and, and, you know, but five is really, really a strange number. Um, and then to change it from an hexagonal to an octagonal also is, is strange. So that's as much, much as I can say. But, you know, after the waters kind of settled in my mind, it, it, it became pretty clear that, okay, it's, this is how it's going to be. Then we just have more games together. We have more time to prepare. Um, and, it's, and it's a tougher road. But if we want to be in an hexagonal or octagonal, we need to beat these kind of teams. We need to be able to, we need to show that. And although we had already shown that, and that's why we were in sixth place, um, you know, it's, it's just a kind of a, another go at the, at the qualifying. And, you know, we're not, we're no strangers to, to starting early in the qualifying round. So, so we'll take it from there. And, you know, we did have a, a fairly friendly draw, you could say, but, but that's the issue. These kind of teams that nobody knows about, they're the ones who cause the most problems sometimes. They're, they have some, some really quality players in England or, or France. And yeah, they, 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 they can really cause some issues. So we need to be really careful with those kind of teams. And although it's easy on paper, uh, those are probably the hardest games, you know. And in terms of the difficulty, do you think that the logistics of it ha bears a huge weight? on you know getting there and being in like the the utmost fitness or 
level of comfort in a sense of being able to deal with matches like this does that have an impact or also what is the psychological impact of dealing with with an opponent that you think would be highly inferior you know and and having to come up with the result because we've noticed that tendency that it seems like the team um tends to to bring its level down to its rivals or it seems that it's really hard to be, to get these results especially in like the last qualifying process yeah, we struggled a little bit in those kind of situations in the last qualifying process. But over the last two years, we've managed to kind of seal those games out. And that's that's been kind of, a, I guess, an issue with people who see La Selecta as, as, a, as a better playing, quote unquote, team. That although we're getting the results now, we're not playing as pretty as we used to. And, and you know, then you got... Uh, the purists saying that we should be playing a different form or a different tactic or a different style or blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we, we, we got the results and, and we were in sixth place and, and gave us a, a huge chance to, to make it to the next round. So I, I don't see an issue. I think, uh, I think the coaching staff has done a really good job of, of scouting these kind of teams and, and knowing when to use our virtues and knowing how to limit our, our deficiencies against those kind of teams primarily aerial situations, for example. They, they, you know, it's no secret that they have an advantage there. So we just have to be careful with that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a super strange situation. You know, you, you talked about uh, being in form or, or, or if we were worried a little bit about that, for the, especially for the games now in October. But I think it goes both ways, or, or rather for all the teams that we're playing against as well. You know, and like it, there's just huge question marks of safety and travel internationally. Um, there's huge question marks of like, you know, what those players and, and their health concerns are or, or how they're being treated. And then you have the case of players playing in multiple countries and bringing them together, going through multiple airports. And I mean, it's a logistical nightmare, you could say. Uh, we, we experienced that now uh, playing in, in, in the European qualifiers uh, with KR that we, you know, we flew to, to Scotland, but we flew in a private jet. You know, we, we left from a private airport. We landed at an empty airport to our own, you know, private bus. Uh, the hotel we had, we had a, a, the whole floor to ourselves. You know, we didn't interact with, I think we maybe interacted with like 10 different people outside of the game over the course of 36 hours, which is incredible in international travel, you know? And you know, we, we, we had to, we got back and we had to take a test when we got into the country and we had to spend five days uh, in a passive quarantine, meaning we could go out for a walk and do this, but we couldn't go to the store or we couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't even pick up my daughter from kindergarten, for example. Like, it's just that kind of passive quarantine. So, and then we take another test and, you know, again, all of us came out negative and stuff, but it's just the logistics of it was, was huge. And that's just from one country. Uh, players traveling to another country who and they are not traveling anywhere either and you know it raises all these concerns about how CONCACAF is going to handle this mm. I have no idea what you know um, I, I don't envy the the person who has to do that job at the moment I'll tell you that much definitely definitely mm. well, well. yeah um, you know I agree with you Pablo that we are living in unprecedented times and, um, you know, going back to the whole change of format, you know, I, I agree with you, my, my same, I had the same thought process where if, if CONCACAF already had established that the top six were going to the hexagonal, all right, you have COVID, you have to change something, maybe it was unfair to, to, to those teams, maybe to the team in the seventh and the eighth place, perhaps. But if you think about the rest, they had no chance whatsoever of of uh, of getting of catching up to us. Hmm. So that's where, in my opinion, I think that that's where Concacaf should have taken the top six and then do something with the with maybe spot seven to eleven, and they could play hmm. a tournament to to determine the two extra spots. Uh, but but like you said, that's a think of thing of the past. I hmm. um you know, also took some time. And, and once you have fresh mind and you kind of have to accept the situation, if, if you focus on the positive, and we talked about this in the previous episode, it could be a good situation for us because we get to uh, have more games together. 
get into mm. a good playing rhythm. I mean, luckily for you in Iceland, the league has started. And I think you're one of the players in, in top shape right now from the national team. But that's not the case with the rest of our of our players. Mm. You know, I, I don't even mm. know what the local teams over there have been doing, whether they've been hosting virtual uh, training uh, or not. So I think at the end of the day, it might end up being a positive thing for us. Uh, mm. But again, it's a matter of of approaching those matches with, you know, that mentality that we have to go out there and win no matter who we have in front of us. We can't underestimate any of those teams because there's a lot of unknowns. And I think mm. we have to go out there and and um, and win and, and basically earn our spot in the octagonal, however that happens. And uh, and build momentum from there, and and maybe we get there, and we we're in this great, we have this great momentum, and hopefully, you know, we make it to the World Cup. So, at the end of the day, it might be a positive situation for the national team. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, sorry I to interrupt, Pablo. Uh, just one thing that I notice is of the players that are now abroad in the U.S. and in other places that are starting to to gain activity. I think it's almost as if you guys have like the spotlight on you guys all of a sudden that maybe some of the players that were on the brink of the starting 11 or even being called up now they're being showcased because they are in action or they are going to be more game fit than uh, players that you think were, would be in the starting 11. And I think mm. that's kind of cool where there's this transition to players um, that have come up being born in other, other countries as well, that now there's like, okay, there's more importance or there might be more importance because of that, that fitness level or the activity that's been going on. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk to you about as well as kind of not just dealing with the news of what's been going uh, on recently, but if you can talk to us, what has been that process, what was that process for you of going pro of being uh, born outside of El Salvador and then finding, finding your way to La Selecta. Could you talk to us a little bit about that process? I know Ugo's familiar, familiarized with, with some of that because you guys yeah. crossed paths early in that situation, but could you, you tell us a little bit about that story? Also, like you as a fan growing up, your relationship with the country, and what was that process of, of uh, stepping out in El Cucatlan with, with that kit on? Yeah, I mean, I still get chills when I think about it. I'll be honest with you, because it's amazing. But to be fair, or rather to not put so much importance to that, I still get chills when I go out and play any game, because I love it. I have so much fun with it, and I enjoy it. And and it's something that I that I value a lot, you know. And and like, I guess, like, I guess the secret is that I would do this for free, you know. <laughs> like that's, like the, that's the bottom line. I do this all day, every day for free. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think twice about it. And luckily, I've created a uh, you know a, a professional environment around myself and my life where uh, I have those advantages over other players that I can get paid for doing it. Because you know, there's millions of players who play the game, and and very few who can who can live that dream to have a a, a career past I guess three four years. I mean, I don't know what the what the average career is for for like a a not so superstar soccer player you know like that, that remains to be seen but I you know my first memories when I was a kid so I was born in Miami and my dad's from El Salvador and my mom's from Nicaragua so they met in in the U.S. different situations basically my dad moved from El Salvador due to the civil war that was happening in the 80s and my mom moved from Nicaragua from a similar political unrest that was happening there around the same time and uh yeah, they were they were in school and, and they met through some friends and, you know, they, they were married. I was born. My brothers, three of the four of us were born in Miami. The fourth one was born in El Salvador when we moved back. So we moved back. I was just around four or, or yeah, three, four. And so my first memories that I still remember today are from El Salvador. You know, those are like the first room. In fact, when I look back on my childhood, and I think of where I'm going to vacation, it's to Miami, you know, it's to the U S or, or, or those kind of things when, when, when it should be the other way around. Cause a lot of people don't know that I lived in El Salvador. So I lived there for about six years. Um, you know, went to school there, started playing soccer there and, and, and I loved it. It was so cool. It was so nice. But 
you know, it's, it's, you don't know any better as a kid, right? So you're waking up at 5 a.m. to fill up some barrels of water in order to have water for the rest of the day because we lived, you know, towards the mountains and we didn't have water all day long. So we'd have water up until I think like 5.30 or 6 a.m. And then the water was shut off until 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. or something for, for whatever reason. I, did, I, did, I was a kid, so I just said, yes, mom, yes, dad, let's, let's help with that, you know? Um, and I played a lot of soccer there. My, my family is not really a, a soccer family. They were more basketball. Uh, so I played basketball too, and I played American football and baseball. And actually my first, my first sport in El Salvador was baseball, which, uh, a lot of people don't know either. And, uh, and we used to play in like some shady neighborhoods. I mean, my mom was scared, but you know, we were just some kids. I, I had no idea, but you can, you can kind of feel that tension that, parents can get around different situations you know um but anyway i played soccer and and around you know then when we moved back to the u.s and and i was just playing and having a lot of fun and moving up the ranks and uh when i was around 14 15 my dad sat me down and said listen this is something that you want to do for real is it something that i'm gonna keep investing money and time in for you or is it something that you are just doing to have fun and you want to go to park because yeah, that's about the age when when you start uh, you know, going out with girls or, or going to parties and, and, you know, so you got to make some decisions or, or, or rather you got to make some sacrifices. Right. And so I, I, I took that decision of, you know, I, I, let's see how far I can go. Right. Let's just, let's just see. And that's when college kind of job dropped in my head, you know, Hey, you can go to college and, and, and if you, cause I, I was bright enough in the classroom that I thought I could, I could muster up a good scholarship, both in academics and athletics. So and luckily, I was able to do that. But, uh, but actually, I started playing through the ODP systems, which is the Olympic Development Programs in the U.S. Uh, there were no academies when I was that age, uh, the way there are today. Uh, there were certainly no MLS academies or anything like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was called into the, into the 15s pool for the U.S., into the 17s pool, uh, and I ended up playing a friendly tournament with the U20s when I was 17, yeah, 17 years old. So I was a, a senior in high school, and I got called into the under-20s camp. Our, our coach then was uh, Thomas Rongen. And, uh, you know, I was there with some, with some current senior national team players from the U.S., and, and it was a great experience for me. We went to Mexico, and we played four or five different games. We were there, you know, we were in, training in, the, in Florida, in uh, Bradenton for about two weeks before we traveled there. And I had so much fun, you know, I mean, it was, it was super cool. It was my first international tournament like that. I had traveled to Argentina with, with the 15s or the, sorry, the 17s earlier, 2005, six, but this was, this was a whole other ball game, you know, and, and around the time that I was getting called into the national, uh, into the colleges, you know, and, and taking a look at that and going to showcases and stuff like that. So, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, and, and all this time, really, like the, the, I don't have an end goal, right? Like, I'm just thinking, cool, yeah, national team, awesome. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, let's just have fun with it. Let's just no go. big deal, you know. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, it was a big deal, of course, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, I made it, you know, that's it, I'm good, right? It was more like, oh, cool, I'm here, so let's enjoy this. And, oh, cool, that, that's a possibility. Should we aim for that? Yeah, why not? You know, like, and I'm, and I'm there just kind of going with the flow, really. And, you know, based on that, I could have maybe had better preparation than, than, than I did. Um, long story short, I, I went to college at St. John's. Uh, phenomenal coaching staff, super professional program. And it was the real, the first real like day-to-day situation where I, where I had to be a professional 24-7. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's where it it became real for me, right? Like, okay, look, this is what's going to take if you want to succeed even at this level. Now imagine if you want to be up there, right? And, and it was a really cool experience. All this time, I have, you know, zero contact from the El Salvador Federation at all moment. Um, I still, you know, I would watch their games all the time because uh, me and my dad would talk about it and he'd just ask me, hey, did you see this? Did you see that? And, you know, but, but I'm just a kid, right? I'm, I'm watching all sorts of soccer. I'm watching Barcelona and Boca Juniors and, you know, Mexican soccer and MLS and whatever was on. I'm just watching because I enjoyed it that much. So when the national teams were playing, of course, I'd watch them. And I'd watch the U.S. as well because I'm, I'm proud to say that I, I have supported them for a long time as well. Um, 
I had the chance to go to 2006 World Cup, for example, in Germany. And I'm, I'm wearing full on uh, US flag and everything, you know, like I loved it. And, and it's the country I was born in, of course. It's the country that gave me opportunities to, to go to school and, and raise me and stuff. And, and I hold it very dear to me, you know, and, and through their, their youth national teams, I also was scouted for, for college and, and beyond. So, you know, it was, a, it was a great platform. Unlucky for me, 2009, I fracture my fifth metatarsal in my left foot. And I'm out for, you know, three, four months, 2009. So this is, this happened March, 2009. I have surgery April, 2009. And the under 20 world cup is that September or that August, September, you know? So I'm, I'm automatically kind of, you know, Hey, listen, you're just, you're not going to be fit enough to, to, to be part of this. So I'm not even considered for the pool. And that was a big blow for me because I had been part of that process in and out and, you know, and I'm looking at these guys going and I'm thinking, oh, I really want to be there, right? Like I really bad. And I, and I missed out on that chance. Um, but anyway, kept working in, in college and, and, and succeeded both on and off the pitch and then had an opportunity to go to Iceland. And when I go to Iceland at the beginning. And it wasn't uh, like a midsummer cold in the Nordic cold type offer. Like you've seen that movie, right? Midsummer. It's a horror. No, I haven't seen it. No. Watch it. <laughs> you weren't yeah. asked to join a cult. I'm just, just wondering. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. That's funny, yeah. So no, how but, was it that uh, you ended it up in, in, in Iceland then? So uh, my girlfriend at the time, she's Icelandic, and uh, she's currently my wife. But at the time she was my girlfriend, she was the only person I'd met from Iceland. And, you know, um, the draft went by, and I didn't get chosen in, into, the, into the super draft. Uh, I did get chosen into a supplemental draft later on, but that was after I made the decision. I'm like, you know, what? I'm just going to go to Iceland because I'm, I need a, I need a vacation. So I, I, I just, I went on vacation and I always take my, my boots with me, my cleats. And you know, when I'm there, I'm like, Hey, you know, you got, is there some teams I can train around with? And, and curiously, I went knocking to KRs, which is the, the most successful club in Iceland. I went knocking to the door and I said, I want to get, can I, can I train with you guys? Is there, is there a possibility? Can I try out? You know? And they just kind of looked at me like, you know it's not how it's done here sorry but he like like oh fair enough my bad like see ya you know and i and i kind of went knocking on on a couple other doors and and had the chance with fjellner which is um at the time they were playing in the in the second division in the b division um and they you know they signed me or at least they offered me a, a contract right then and there and i was like yeah cool let me let me think about it and at, this was about the same time that i got the 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 message from Ugo saying, listen, there's a under 23 Olympic uh, camp and they're going to look at some players in, that are, you know, that are not living in El Salvador. Do you want to come? And, and that was a, that was a fun opportunity. You know, it was a cool, it was my first time that I had ever gotten some sort of contact from the, the El Salvador Federation or anybody involved with El Salvador or anything. So it was really cool for me to just consider because, you know, I hadn't been considered for any international competition since 2008, nine. Right. So I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? Why not, right? And uh, and it was really cool. I met uh, Richard Manhiva, for example. We met there, and and you know we're still really good friends today. Uh, of course, Ugo. You know he he organized. I don't. Yeah. You know when I look back, I'm thinking, how the hell did he pull that off, right? But there was a lot of stuff that 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 um, was really not taken care of by the federation, which should have, and he put a lot of effort and time into it. So. You know, again, I'm I'm always like I've never hidden it from you, Hugo. You know that I'm super thankful for that. And like, again, it it was a first opportunity where I could be like, okay, let's uh, let's let's show them what I got. Right. Problem was, I'm coming from a nine hour time difference. You know, I'm there for five days or six days, and we we're playing four games in these six days or five days. You know? And it was ridiculous. Like, we, I don't know if you remember, Hugo. Like, we we played. Yeah we played like 8 a.m. games and then like 4 p.m. games the next day. And it was just like, you know, we had no time for anything else other than just wake up, play a game, sleep, eat, wake up, play a game, eat, sleep. Like it was just like this over and over. And I'm just like desvelado totalmente. You know, like I'm, I don't know what, what day it is or, or anything. I don't know what hour it is. My body is just still adjusting to the time again. So long story short, I, I showed some flashes, but I didn't show my best. And, uh, like rightly so, I didn't get chosen by at the time it was Tuqualfaro, the coach. But uh, but me and me and Ernesto Goches, which was the coordinator of the, of the national teams at the time, we stayed in touch and 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 
that's how it led to me being called into or considered again for the senior national team once I once I, I established myself better in Iceland. But it but it was it was a process. I took I guess you could say I took the long the long the long road to get there. But uh but it was really something that, that made me value it all the more. Definitely. Mm. And was was there any like uh were you torn at all? when you had to make that decision of changing federation or what were you at a point where you're like, you know what, I think this is like the best step to take. How was that process? You know, it's, it wasn't ever like a choice for me. It, it, you know, it's not, it's not like I had the U S knocking on my door either. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't like that, but it wasn't really a choice for me. It was, it was really simple. It was like, yeah, I want to play for us. Of course. And like in a, in a, in a utopian world, I would play also for the U.S., right? Because like that, that would be really cool to represent both countries of, of, that I consider my my home countries, right? But uh, but that, that that's not possible. That's not the case. So when I get the chance to play for El Salvador, I'm thinking, yeah, let's take it. Let's see where this goes, right? And at the time, I was just playing for the or or at least like trying out for the under 23. So it wasn't even a senior team. So you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking maybe there's a chance sometime down the line, if, if the U.S. calls, I do really well against the U.S., maybe I get a chance, dot, 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 right? But, but when I joined the national team, the senior national team, Albert Roca was the coach, and, and I mean, he's by far the best coach I had, uh, just in preparation, just in the way he, he, he analyzed the games and the, and the training, training sessions. And, it, and, I mean, it's no secret, he, he was at Barcelona for a long time, and he's now considered to be going back to Barcelona. I mean, that's, yeah, it says think, a lot think right of his there. level. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, no other words needed. Right. And, exactly. and he, uh, he really took me under his wing and, and the guys, the, the squad really did that as well with me. And, and, you know, a lot of them are still there today. And I, and it was, it was really cool for me. I, I was really lucky that I joined into a squad that was healing after everything that had happened, of course, but, but at the same time, really open to, to players like me, right? Because a lot of them had been playing together through different youth teams, and I, and I didn't know any of them. You know? So that was, it was something new for me, for sure. No, Pablo, I think um, I was, haven't spoken much yet, but I feel like we can go on and on and on <laughs> for yeah. hours. But, you know, one thing I do want to say is that I want to express my admiration for the path that you've taken. Because mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, amongst my friends and, and, and Andres uh, uh, knows this, when I think of a player that, that I know personally that has the potential to, to be the captain of the national team, I always think of you. Because, you. you know, from the moment that I met you back in 2013 when I uh, organized that camp. Yeah. 2012, correct. Yeah. When I organized that camp, I picked you up at the airport. I remember you were a last minute addition uh, yeah. in, in part because I couldn't get a hold of you. I couldn't mm. get a hold of you. And I happened to be in El Salvador a couple of days before the camp to announce the camp and all these things. And I think your dad called me somehow. I spoke to your dad and, 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 and that's how yeah, yeah, yeah. we managed to get you in. But you know, you were definitely when you describe right now your path and how I think that you have always taken everything with a, a, a with maturity. You know, mm. you, you showed up to that camp and you didn't seem like super hyped about it. Uh, you were just kind of just like like a straight face, like you were just <laughs> you were just focused. The man was jet lag, man. Jet lag. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'm like, it, who are you? No, no, no I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, some of the other guys were, you know, very excited and pumped, mm. but at the same time, nervous. And, mm. and, and you didn't show any of that. You were mm. focused. Uh, you know, we had the games and, and maybe you didn't perform the way you wanted to perform. But I remember, you know, everyone, you know, going back to the hotel and then you would just be there, relax and go to the pool and read a book and, and at something very different than, you know, what I've mm. seen from other players. And then, you know, the next day will come and we will do the same thing. And you were always very um, focused on, I guess, on what you wanted. And, mm. and, uh, and then, you know, you, I didn't know you were in Iceland until I picked you up from the airport. You told me, oh, yeah, I was coming from Iceland. I was like, oh, I thought yeah. you were in Miami. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you've taken the, the long road 
and mm -hmm. and and it's not easy as as you know it and and those of us who've been involved in soccer in some ways it's not easy to stay in a european league for as long as you have mm -hmm. and and it takes it takes discipline and i think you you have that discipline i think you over and over again you've shown that in the national team both the way you you present yourself on the pitch and outside of the pitch you show that you are uh, a true professional and i think that's part Thank of you. the reason why you you stay there so long it's not something that just is given to you i think you work very hard mm. for that and 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 another subject that you touched on is your support for the u.s national team mm. and, and i find that very interesting because i i came to the u.s when i was nine but i support the u.s national team as well You know, when mm. the U.S. is playing the World Cups, I'm, I'm with the U.S. And yeah. I think that that is, that is one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast. Mm. Yeah, because it tends to be something taboo where people back in El Salvador can't really fathom the concept of here you're supporting the U.S. in part because of the recent dominance and how, yeah, it's a huge hurdle getting through the U.S. in any type of competition. And then on top of that, knowing this isn't really a soccer country or hasn't been for the longest time. So I think that's always been something that, that bugs people. But yeah, I think it is important to be able to embrace the fact that, yeah, you can embrace both uh, cultures or how many countries may be uh, in your background. Like uh, I have a daughter on the way. She's, she could represent four countries, you know, or she could be There you go. four countries. And it's like, it's, it's mind boggling. <laughs> But I think, That's the beauty of, of a globalized sport and that it, it is cool. And, and we do thank you to be able to talk about how, what it's meant to you being able to, to be in the middle of, of both countries and both federations up to a point. So, yeah, no, thanks definitely for talking about this. Yeah. yeah. It, Go ahead. It, it, it's, it's hard for, for a lot of people to get that in their mind. You know, it's not – anything it's not that there's like an againstness against el salvador or the u.s it's just that for those of us who've been in the united states for a long time we are grateful for a lot of the things that we have because mm. we are here in this country and and when it comes to sports it's no it's no different you know we support the united states uh but if if la selecta is playing against the u.s you know it's going to be la selecta full on um but i always want the u.s to do well You know, Definitely. as long as, as long as they're not playing against the selector, and um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, a very interesting subject, and I love that you that you brought it up because it is something we want to talk about. You know, it's it's funny because that that brings up a, a whole other topic of like one of the idiosyncrasies that I've noticed of El Salvadorian culture. So, and and to be fair, it's not just El Salvador; it's also Latin American culture, and it's. If somebody has success, it means I can't either, right? So either you hate them or you love them, right? But you can't have both. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Like, so just because the U.S. is being successful doesn't mean El Salvador has to fail, right? Or just because Honduras has success doesn't mean El Salvador has to fail. Or Costa Rica or Mexico. It doesn't matter who it is, right? And like, just because one country is, is, is going through a process that they're going through at that moment doesn't mean that yours has to fail. Now I understand that there's three and a half spots for the world cup. I get that. Right. Uh, and, and, and you're going to compete for those spots, but once you're not there, once you're eliminated, barring some, you know, really unfair situation, like you can't do anything about it. So you either sulk, right. Or you support the teams that are there because at the end of the day, when, Costa Rica is doing good in the World Cup. It brings attention to CONCACAF and it brings attention to El Salvador as a, as a, as a, as a byproduct. And now you can dwell deeper into the Latin American culture, or in this case, El Salvador, because, you know, we, we've, at least I've lived there, you've lived there as well, you know, you understand it. Like, when somebody does well, personally, then people get jealous as well, right? Like, oh, why is, you know, ah, no, I kissed him, I'm again. You know, dot, dot, dot. Like, you can create so many different things. Like, people start getting jealous because somebody has success because it means that they can't. And that's the biggest lie. That's the biggest lie in, our, in, in, in the culture that I've seen. 
just because I'm successful in Iceland doesn't mean somebody else can't be successful in a different country or even in Iceland. Like that's not, it doesn't mean that at all. But people see, oh, he's successful. Nah, he, he was born in the U.S. He has a different career path and blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's, that's a reality. People try to give themselves, uh, I'm not going to say excuses, but rather they, they don't motivate themselves enough to, to, to hold themselves accountable. There's no accountability in the decisions that they make on a day-to-day basis. You talked about discipline and maturity and stuff like that. And, and I appreciate you, you underlining those, those factors of mine because, you know, I have a, I have a set number of values that I, or, or behaviors, let's just say behaviors better. Cause I can say that I'm one thing and behave a different way. And it's the behavior that counts. Right. So I have a set number of behaviors that I, that I value over, over, over the rest. And, you know, discipline is one of them, uh, definitely maturity or at least being responsible for, for my own actions. And, uh, and, you know, I like, I like the sport. And, and, and with that love of the sport comes the responsibility and the discipline necessary to uphold those values or the behaviors that I hold dear in order to then enjoy the sport the most, right? So I love watching it, right? I love playing. I love talking about it. I love doing all this. But at the end of the day, when I'm not doing any of those things, uh, who am I, right? Like, what am I doing? And, and that's where a lot of people stop, right? Because you see, let's just take, the person who's in the most amount of spotlight in their entire world, which is Messi, right? Like, I mean, people see Messi and he's, oh, he's a soccer player. He's just, but he's also a dad and he's a businessman and he's a, a son and a, and, a, and a husband. And, and he's a guy that loves trying different wines or, or talking to his friends or, you know, like, and you can make up a million different things of who he is, but people just say, Oh, he's a soccer player. So let's just, that, that's the world that revolves around him. Um, and I've always wanted to show that, through my actions that you can be a good soccer player and be good at school. Most people think you have to sacrifice one for the other. You can support the El Salvador and support the U S you can be born in, in the, in the U S and play for El Salvador. You can speak Spanish well, and you can speak English well. You can, you know, you, you, you can, you can come up with so many different things, right? That people hold taboo in our, in our, in our culture. But the bottom line is what kind of, what kind of, what kind of behaviors do you want to have in your life? You know, are they going to make you better or are they going to, are they going to hold you back? And I think excelling in the gray zone. It's that's, that's right. Yeah. And, and it's, and that gray zone doesn't exist. That's this, that's another secret, right? Like that taboo exists only because we think it exists. That's it. You know, like most people like you support us. How dare you? Right. Like, I mean, you're from El Salvador. It's like, yeah. So I support Barcelona too. Does that make me like, you know, and it's just because I support Barcelona doesn't mean I hate Real Madrid. That's, that's another, you know what I mean? Like that's where you can, you can draw that line or that distinction. And it's at the end of the day, it's just sport. It's just supposed to be fun. It's supposed to enjoy it. So to, to, to bring it around, Ugo, like, you know, the maturity, the discipline, the love of the game, the, the enjoyment that you get from it, uh, talking about it, organizing it, you know, in your case, uh, playing it, watching it, whatever it might be like, it's just a game, right? And let's just enjoy it for what it is. Like, in 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 my case, I play it, and 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 I'm lucky for that, right? But but it wasn't an accident. Like, I worked my ass off to get there. Yeah, and um, you know what? I mean, I'm just loving that we're doing this show, really, because because we're talking about these things that we're like, oh my god, I wish we had started talking yeah. about this ten years ago. And, 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 and another, because I'm learning a lot from this interview as well, you know, you bring up uh, your relationship and your experience of Albert Roca. Mm. And, and in my opinion, you've played the best soccer in the national team with Albert Roca. Mm. And it's like he found the, your position. Mm. You know, he, 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 he um, I think that he made you a great player in the national team and 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 the um, and it was like night and day because i think we had that short period of juan de dios uh ramirez rest in peace uh, and he was i think he was using as a left back which yeah you're left footed i think you play a little bit in that position yes you can play it but it was def- definitely not your your forte 
and no. and 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 I think that set you back, and that's probably part of the reason why you spent a few years um, not being called. I think it was it was just from that last image that people had of you. But it, during Albert Roca, I mean, you were you were unstoppable. You know, you were you were like the la bujia, you know, the spark plug of the of the the between the two forwards. You know, you were feeding balls to them. You were holding the ball and, and, and shooting at the goal. And it was like some of the best soccer I've seen from you was with um, Albert Roca. And another thing that I, I, that I want to bring up, you know, for, for the fans to know is that you also, I mean, you have a brother who plays for Nicaragua, uh, mm -hmm. Renato, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and do you also have Italian passport or Spanish passport? Spanish passport. Yeah. Spanish passport. Is that through your through your dad or your mom? Yeah, that's my dad's family. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. And how is that? Um, you know, when you think about possibly playing against your brother, you know, how how do what goes on inside of you when you have that? I mean, I want I wanted that draw to be El Salvador Nicaragua, <laughs> like for this stuff. I I I was so looking forward to it. And okay, it didn't happen. It was a one in, in six chance of happening. It didn't happen. And, and all right, no problem, right? Um, he, you know, he chose his path. And, and I'm really happy for him because, like I, like I said earlier, my mom's from Nicaragua. And he, actually, Renato was the only brother born in El Salvador. So it's really curious, uh, his choice. But, but I respect it 100%. I mean, El Salvador, he, he had a similar situation. El Salvador didn't give him a call or anything. The Federation didn't contact him once until he was already in Nicaragua's radar and seriously considering playing there. Um, and they had a bit more stability, actually, because their national team had the same head coach for a long time. Uh, and that left a good mark on him, you know, because it, it showed that stability. They were growing. They were getting much better. Nicaragua, I mean, I've, I've only played them, yeah, once, 2014. We played away to Nicaragua and we won 2 0, but they played really well. Uh, and, you know, people are like, yeah, you're supposed to beat Nicaragua, of course. You know? But like, that's, not the, that's not the truth anymore in soccer around the world. Uh, anyway, the, the bottom line is he chose his path, and, and, and I'm really happy that he made that decision all on his own. Uh, I, I would love to play against him. That's as much as I can say. I mean, I'd lo also love to play with him, you know. And, And he's a, he's a really good soccer player, and and that just shows the quality that Nicaragua can have. Definitely, definitely. Um, then switching up a little bit, um, in terms of your career in Iceland, is do you f feel like it'd be ideal for you to stay put, or what's on the horizon for you? Um, and again, congratulations for representing and have a lot at the the qualifying for the champions because obviously that's that's something huge obviously it's not even the first time you get to do it but that's that's definitely huge for us but yeah what okay. what is on the horizon for you at this point if you don't mind sharing yeah sure so i'm on i'm on my last year of my contract but i have an option for one more year uh that i can unilaterally choose to to extend or 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 deny um i don't know you know <laughs> everything is so strange with 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 the pandemic around the world that the markets are really quiet and they're really, you know, people are really being conservative in that market. Um, I would like to try something else for sure. Uh, I think I have the capacity for that. I, I actually, I know I have the capacity for that. It's just a matter of finding a, a team where I'm comfortable, a team where, where I can excel. Uh, like you mentioned, Ugo, the coaching, the coaching staff makes a huge difference as well. Uh, but also a place where my, my wife and my daughter can be comfortable, you know, and, and now more than ever, considering everything that's happening around the world. Iceland has been one of the places that have dealt with the situation the best. Uh, the government and its citizens really work hand in hand to, to create some really good solutions to, to get everything, you know, as much back to normal as is possible in these situations. And, And I'm, I'm really happy to live here. You know, I'm, I'm really in a, I'm not going to say comfortable because that has a, a negative connotation, but I'll, I'll say that I'm really, really happy to be here. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I've considered Iceland would maybe be my third home country, I guess you could say, besides El Salvador and the U.S. And I've lived, I've lived here just as long as I lived in El Salvador. I've lived here, you know, I know the language. My daughter was born here. 
uh, I support them when they go to the Euros or, or, or when they were in the last World Cup. You know, it's, it's, I, I love it here. And then, and then you have a place where, where, where I can also do what I love. You know, like, what's, why would I change that, right? Like, it needs to be a really, really nice offer. It needs to be something that's really attractive. And, and I've mentioned it to Ugo before, for example. Like, I, I would love to play in the U.S. and, and check out the, the U.S., market when i had the opportunity to play in mls mls was nowhere near the league it is today uh in terms of organization in terms of of competitiveness it's it's really high level today and and it's something that i would love to do um especially now that miami has a team for example and i'm 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 a miami boy i mean that that would just be phenomenal just playing in front of my parents and stuff like that and and you know it's just a matter of, of finding the right the, the right place and just because it is home for me and just because uh, I would like to do it doesn't mean that there's a chance for me there you know so that's that's it's it's hard to accept for the quakes man the quakes need someone in the midfield <laughs> hey yeah you know I'm, I'm a big fan of how uh, El Profe Almeida plays with this team you know and, and they're they're a fun team to watch especially the last couple couple of months so I don't know. We'll see. You know, it, again, there's nothing, nothing concrete in the horizon. But, but, you know, let's just say that I'm, I'm, I'm putting my toe in the water around the world. Nice, nice. Well, I think we don't want to take too much more of your time because we're almost hitting that hour mark. But to close off, would you describe to us the moment or the the whole process of putting on that kit? and going through the corridors uh, in Irkutska and what that sensation and experience, experience was like? Oof, uh, it's a, that's really tough because there's, no, there's nothing like it. I mean, first of all, Irkutska is like a, like a Roman gladiator arena. You know, like, you, you know, you've got people that hate you and you've got people that love you, right? And, and when we played Honduras there, for example, it was, it, it was a war. And that's may, maybe the most warlike scenario that i've been involved in uh and vice versa when we went back to honduras but anyway uh you know el cusca has it's 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 a really i'm gonna say antique stadium because i don't want to say anything another word for it but yeah it's it's old and uh but it's it's super nice i mean it's been there since i since i was a little kid of course and i remember passing by and it was it was oddly painted red and yellow but you know, now it's blue and white and it's amazing. I mean, the atmosphere is just bursting. It's just, it's one of the funnest places to play. And it's really tough to play there, you know, especially on a, on a humid 35 degree night. Uh, people with fireworks or, or something like that, you can't breathe, you know, but it's so much fun. And you've got, you can't even hear yourself think sometimes. Uh, the, the, the quarter goes underneath the stands and you you know you exit basically at the halfway line so that's really cool as well uh but like you said putting on the kit you know uh is it's and seeing the the logo the the the, the federation logo and knowing that you're about to represent your 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 country is 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 amazing i can't i can't define it uh but like I told you at the beginning, I get chills like that before every game because I know what it what it is. And when you're out there, you realize it's just a game. I mean, I might as well be playing out in the park with my friends or my brothers because that's what it's like. It's just the ball's moving faster or, you know, the opponents maybe tackling a little bit harder, but it's the same exact game. And and I wish I could win every game. I really wish I could because, like, then it would be ideal, right? That would be, like, the utopian thing. That's, like, the equivalent of, a lawyer winning every single case or the investment banker banking on every single, uh, you know, share that he buys, but, but that's not the case around the world. And that's the beauty of, of, of each industry and soccer is no different than that. And it's so much fun because anything can happen. And I wish I could win every single game just because like the people's expectations are for us to win every game. It doesn't matter who we're playing. That's, that shows you the kind of belief they have in us. Um, and the fans, I guess, are the number one thing that I enjoy about it. I mean, forget the jersey, forget playing, forget like the fans, especially the El Salvadorian fans. And they've taken a, 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 a nice endearment to me, and I and I've always respected and given them, uh, given them my best in return, which is the only way I can show my appreciation. Right? Uh, they're amazing. I mean, they're they're they can they can be really really tough, right? 
but it's like a it's like a parent tough love you know it's like hey you could do better kind of thing um and i've always respected that i've always taken it that way it doesn't matter what the words say you know you can you can read through the words and see the emotion and that's always the the driving factor um and that's why i've never said no to playing with the national team because it's it's amazing no, Pablo, one final question. I know we're sure. wrapping up, but, yeah, yeah. you know, the question I had for you, there's this um, idea out there. Most of the time from, from Salvadorians from El Salvador that playing for the national team when you have other options has like this negativity, you know, like, um, mm. like it might bring down your career. And, and so the question that I have for you, do you feel now that you have experience playing for the national team, for you as an American Salvadorian, do you feel that playing for El Salvador has um, affected your career in a positive way or a ne negative way or neither? So I'm a really positive person. So right off the bat, it's a, it's a really positive experience. But not because, not because I'm going to win every game, like I said, right? Like if I was playing for the Brazil national team, it'd be really easy to say, yeah, it's really positive because you're, you have the chance to win every competition you participate in. Uh, but that's not the reason why it's been positive. It's been positive because, uh, you know, I've, I've been able to reconnect with, with my dad's country in a, in a more personal matter because now I have a very, very specific and personal connection with, with my dad's country which in turn became my country um i've been able to reconnect with my family there as well with the fans i've been able to to tell my teammates in club ball saying hey i'm about to go play with the national team i've been i've been called up or i'm going to go play at the gold cup or i'm going to play qualifiers or uh, the uncaf whatever it might be um i've made some really good friends in that national team uh i've seen some really 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 good players and some potential I've also seen some stuff that I don't want to do, right? I've, I've seen some stuff that, I, that I'd like to learn from. Um, I've had some phenomenal coaches. I've had some, some coaches that left a lot to be desired. But the bottom line is that whoever, you know, whatever choice you take, whether it's to play at the park with your friends or, or to play with El Salvador, or play with the U.S., play for any club in the world, like no matter where you play or how you play, it's more about why do you play you know, and, and, and how you're going to see the game. Everybody has their own why and everybody sees the game differently. And that's why the game is so beautiful because everybody can play it differently. There's no right way. You know, Iceland, Iceland wins and they don't, they don't play nice soccer, right? Argentina plays nice soccer. They don't win. Germany plays some very mechanical soccer and they're still attractive sometimes. Uh, like, you know, there's no, there's no right way. It's, it's super cool to like, to see the different, different versions of soccer. and. I said it earlier, everybody has their own path. Uh, I love the path that I've taken. I mean, I'm also the kind of person that once I get on the path, I, I don't look back. I'm just kind of seeing where it, where it goes. But, uh, but I'm loving the ride. I mean, I'm loving the ride. And, and whether it's El Salvador or some, or, or some other place, you know, not because I could have played for somewhere else or, or, or longed to play somewhere else, but rather... Once I've made that decision to play for El Salvador, I'm 100% there. There's, no, there's nothing pulling me back saying, oh, you should have done this or you should have gone there. No, I'm 100% I'm there. There was never a doubt once I've made that decision. Um, and I think everybody needs to see whatever it is they choose to do in that way. If you want to be a, a, a you know, let's just say lawyer, because we, we, I, I touched that. You want to be a lawyer? Just go be a lawyer. Be the best damn lawyer you could be in that subject. You still got to choose a subject within law, right? And go do that. Same with investment banking. Same with, you know, teaching or, or, or anything, any other profession in the world. Just choose it and do, be the best you can be in that moment, in that, in that area. El Salvador became a vehicle of, of, of really cool games for me. It became a, a place where, where, I've always held it close to my heart. So it's, it, it wasn't even like I could, I could tell you, Hey, you know, I had a choice to make and, and, you know, I, I took it. No, it came to me and I, I earned it and I, and I grabbed onto it and I've held onto it and it, and I've made some mistakes and it fell a little bit and I grabbed onto it again. And, you know, it's been a it's been that kind of learning process for me, but 
but I loved it. it uh, it's, it's definitely, definitely a positive experience. Well, definitely. Thanks for taking the time and, and chatting with us about all these, these subjects. Cause I think this kind of uh, breaks the door open on kind of the vibe or the angle that we're, we're trying to go for with this podcast of the topics that we're trying to talk about the audience that we're trying to reach. So we definitely yeah. appreciate you taking, taking the time and hopefully yeah. uh, with, yeah, thank you guys. Once the fixtures are official and, uh, and uh, we have stuff to look forward to concretely. Maybe you'd be down to talk with us either pre or post match, depending on, on your availability. But we definitely look forward to having you back again and talking yeah, more definitely. of the newsworthiness of stuff. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. I had a lot of fun, and I'm and thank I, you, thank you, Paul. Listen, you will. I I hope you guys do really well with this because it's a really cool thing, and it's some conversations like you said. It will. Wow, you know, I wish they were available ten years ago, right? I wish yeah. or, or, or more. Or before, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. imagine Hugo Perez. You know what? This type of stuff would have helped all the Hugo Perez's along the way that didn't necessarily yeah. have that that uh, bridge to to La Selecta. But Andres, they 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 took the choice, right? And and yeah. and everybody has their own path. So definitely, because you guys are starting it now, uh, and it hasn't been done before, like. Let's go, go for it, you know. Keep, keep developing that. And, and I wish you guys all the best in that, in that project. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Look forward to more conversations. Cheers. <laughs>